Hello, tonight on Calendar, the legacy of Nurse Beverly Allett. Victims' parents fight for compensation for their suffering. The cost of search and rescue. A missing ship turns up safe, but who picks up the bill? And we meet Kelvin, the little creature brought back from the brink of death. And the chop for the famous Barnsley chop. All those stories after the ITN News. And straight after calendar, join us for tonight when John Baxter treats a pigeon with bad feet. That's at 6.30. Yeah, it's not too late to change your mind, you know. Hey, no, six years really isn't that long to get to know a lass. It's traditional. The condemned man has a hearty breakfast. Mm, great. Delicious flakes of corn drenched in ice-cold milk. Kellogg's cornflakes. How could you have forgotten how good they taste? Hello? Steve, it's that last from last night. Mm. Only joking, it's your mum. <laughs> has he eaten his breakfast yet? Kellogg's cornflakes. Too good to be forgotten. system with moisturizers protects your skin you pay a pound for a lottery instant but you get seven instant scratch cards free with Saturday's Daily Mail and another seven in the mail on Sunday play them for a one in five chance Yay! of winning a cash prize <laughs> we've already given away over a million pounds in prizes will you win 50,000 pounds this weekend don't miss your scratch cards free with Saturday's Daily Mail Kev, can you tell me what you really want? The KFC Chicken Fillet Burger. It's finger licking good. It's the end. Don't miss the dining room set of sale. We've never had a sale like this before, but it ends Sunday 5 p.m. Everything is reduced in price. Everything is free for a year. You take two years free credit and pay nothing for the first year. You save on everything. Tables, chairs, war units, every style, every finish, all at sale prices. Huge savings like this table and four chairs, just eight seven nine. But hurry, sale prices, two years free credit, and everything free for a year ends Sunday 5 p.m. at the dining room center. A new series and a trying time for Paul Merton. No, what's wrong? I can't get it off for you, Anna. Dealing with the barbaric. Guilty. Send him to jail. Lock him up. Flog him. Birch him. So much for the gentler sex. <laughs> Much as I disagree with you all, all right. Let the criminal go free. I don't care. Well, that's it then. The unanimous verdict of not guilty. We can all go home. <laughs> guilty or not guilty, Paul Merton and 12 Angry Men Consider. Friday at 8.30. Back to tonight, and at 9 o'clock, we've a brand new series set around a metropolitan armed robbery team. They're the Thief Takers. But now on Yorkshire, ITN. <laughs> From the studios of ITN The News, with John Suchet. Good evening. A damning report on the standards of education among England's schoolchildren shocked education experts and politicians alike today. It showed about half of all 11-year-olds and 14-year-olds aren't up to scratch on English. And by the same amount, they can't do maths either. John Major admitted the figures were disappointing. Tony Blair called them appalling, a disaster. This from Kevin Dunn. Seven and 14 year olds have been sitting tests for some years, but last summer for the first time, more than half a million 11 year olds were tested. The results, not good. In maths and English, three quarters of seven year olds reached or passed the expected standard. But at 14, almost half failed to make it. And at 11, less than half made the grade. So what were they failing? In English, 11 year olds were asked to spell 20 words from the relatively easy, like where and should, to the more difficult, like apprehensive and absorbed. Only a third got 16 or more right, a third got less than half right. The Education Secretary accepted the results were disappointing. The very important 
issue, however, is that we have the tests and we know what is going on. And it is only this year and for the first time, and thanks to the government reforms, that we do know what's going on. That's the important thing. Now we can do something about it. Teachers say the problem in primary schools is that they are overstretched in classes which are oversized. We have this aberration at 11-year-olds, um, uh, and that, I think, is due to the demands uh, of the curriculum. It's overcrowded, and primary teachers are expected to be subject specialists in nine or ten subjects. The government says tests themselves raise standards as well as set yardsticks, and they predict a big improvement by 11-year-olds next year. Kevin Dunn, ITN. Those results led to bitter clashes in the Commons with an unexpected result. Tony Blair sought to throw the spotlight on Conservative education policies, away from his troubles with Harriet Harman. But he ran into an ambush as John Major turned the tables on him in an increasingly bitter and personal clash. Our political correspondent, Adrian Britton, reports. The Prime Minister conceded the results were disappointing. The Labour leader said they were appalling, accusing John Major of complacency. These are children that were born under a Conservative government, sent to school under a Conservative government, educated under a Conservative government, and the failure is not theirs, but that of the Conservative government. But John Major couldn't resist a dig at the Shadow Health Secretary for sending her son to a selective grammar school. Perhaps the right honourable gentleman can explain why some of his right honourable friends remove their children from labour education authorities <laughs> and have them educated under Conservative education authorities. And on class size, there was, of course, the matter of Tony Blair's son attending a grant-maintained school. The average class size in secondary schools in Islington is actually lower than at the London Oratory. <laughs> the reason they want to focus attention on one 11-year-old child is to conceal the damage they have done to millions of our children. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the <coughs> right honourable gentleman will really, will really have to learn to keep cool under pressure. That's a reference to Mr Blair saying he wouldn't buckle under pressure. For the second time a week, Tory backbenchers cheered as Mr Major left the chamber. They considered it a commanding performance. He said to have told a colleague later that he was loving the smell of electioneering. Adrian Britton, ITN, Westminster. Next, on the early evening news, Ulster, the rift grows between Dublin and London. A surprise call from the CBI's boss, pay workers more. And what OJ said about his wife's murder. I could not have killed anyone. And I did not kill anyone. The Northern Ireland peace process is once again in trouble as the rift grows between London and Dublin. The row is over John Major's call for elections to a Northern Ireland Assembly. The Irish Prime Minister, John Bruton, dismissed that as no more than an idea. Our political correspondent, Jackie Ashley, reports. A hostile reaction from the Irish Premier in Strasbourg today to talk of early elections in Northern Ireland. Nothing, he said, must detract from the end of February deadline for the start of all party talks. That was an agreement that we made, the Prime Minister and myself. I have no indication, and I would not be willing to entertain an indication of a change in an agreement of that nature. So alarmed was John Major by talk of a rift that he sent a letter to Mr Bruton this afternoon, reassuring the Irish government that he was not proposing another Stormont-type body. But in Dublin and the Catholic communities of Northern Ireland, the idea persisted that the British government had cut a deal with the Unionists. Not so, said the Ulster Unionist leader. If we have not brought forward this proposal, then the whole peace process would, in the next few weeks, have shuddered to a complete halt. The government was stressing that the Mitchell report on decommissioning weapons had not said the IRA could not decommission before talks began, but that they would not. Elections were now another way through. I hope very much that uh, that, on reflection, will be seen to be a way round an impasse represented by the refusal of paramilitaries to even start giving up their arms. Sinn Féin have just repeated their strong opposition to the idea of elections. The danger now is that the stumbling block of decommissioning has just been replaced by the stumbling block of elections. Jackie Ashley, ITN, Westminster.
The boss's organisation, the CBI, took everyone by surprise today and called for higher wages for workers. Their Director General, Adair Turner, told business leaders higher pay would boost the feel-good factor. And using Labour's buzzword, he praised the idea of a stakeholding economy. Here's Mark Webster. Strong stuff for the Director General of the CBI. After years of stressing the importance of pay restraint, Mr Adair said the workers should get a bigger slice of the national cake. Over the medium term, real incomes will rise. And indeed, not only they will rise, but we want them to rise. I mean, businesses want consumers to be able to spend more. Well, consumers can't spend more unless they have real income rises. As the store's share option scheme is how the CBI thinks staff should be rewarded in the future. Otherwise, the organisation fears Britain could face another inflationary wage spiral. But Mr Adair's idea has found favour. I think what they're recognising is that Britain can't just go down market, uh, down towards the low paid end of particular product areas, and has got to be a good, com good competitor, but with good terms and conditions of employment. But the surprisingly low level of pay settlements has been one of the key reasons keeping the inflation rate low. And the authorities will be anxious to make sure this doesn't mark the beginning of a wages free for all. Mark Webster, ITN, the Bank of England. Religious leaders today rejected a call by the Prince of Wales for lottery money to help build mosques and temples for the millennium. Hindu and Muslim leaders said they couldn't accept money from gambling. The Prince has warned that the millennium celebrations could become a giant, meaningless party. Joan Thurkettle looks at the arguments. In his article, Prince Charles focuses on regeneration and spiritual renewal, ideas with which he's long been associated. The piece is published in the Prince's own architectural journal, Perspectives. He says, if the millennium is to be no more than the chance for a giant but essentially meaningless party, we surely need to think more deeply about what the millennium means. Magazine editor, Giles Worsley. What he's shown is that we can't just look at the millennium and say, it's a time to build some buildings, it's time to have a great festival. We've got to think why we're having a millennium and how the millennium can actually be used to improve everybody's life. So far, ideas for new projects include a 500-foot wheel on London's South Bank and a massive tower at Greenwich. Where, asked the Prince, are the plans for a great religious building like the new Hindu temple in Neasden? He sees this as a chance to help different spiritual faiths come together, but lottery money poses a problem. It would be wrong for us, as Hindus, practicing Hindus, to accept funds which have been generated in the manner that they have. It's also against the Muslim faith to take money raised from gambling. Whatever else, Prince Charles, with his forthright views, has opened up yet another debate on how lottery money should be spent. Joan Thurkettle, ITN. A former police sergeant was jailed for seven years today for jury nobbling. John Young, who was once awarded the Queen's Gallantry Medal for bravery, is the first former or serving police officer to be tried for the offence. Judge Gerald Butler said the crime struck at the very roots of our system of criminal justice. O.J. Simpson used his first full television interview today to lash out at those who still believe he killed his wife and her friend. He told them, if you don't like me, leave me alone. Our Washington correspondent, Bill Neely, watched the interview. Mr. Simpson, thanks for joining us. We appreciate he was found pleasure. not guilty, but the doubts and the questions have never died, and they didn't hear. Did you indeed commit those murders? No, I did not commit those murders. I couldn't kill anyone and I don't know of anyone that was involved. Uh, Most Americans don't believe him. So here, O.J. Simpson cast himself as the victim of the legal system. I sat in a cell by myself. They wouldn't let me speak to another prisoner. When I walked down the halls, they made all the other prisoners turn their backs to me. I, I mourn. As the victim of women. A certain group of women, women, I should say, out there, who has had a bad experience with a man who's who's uh, been in a, an abusive relationship, uh, I have become their whipping boy. In reality, he is a confessed wife beater and the police believe he is a murderer. A shortage of cash, he says, has made it hard for him to hunt the real killer. On this video, you will hear that. He was confident, even cocky, unwilling to talk about the evidence in the murders because he has done so in a video. This home video cassette documents... Simpson has been answering questions of a different kind for three days now. The victim's families are suing him for wrongful death. Their lawyers grilling him. The protesters jeering him. We have a long way to go, and uh, 
Progress is good. Progress is excellent. Simpson has been shunned by neighbors, dropped by sponsors, ostracized by his country club. So he plays golf and tries to talk his way back into America's heart. I love my kids. I love Nicole. I could not have killed anyone, and I did not kill anyone. I'm Simpson American. will be back in court to face the victims' families in the spring. Bill Neely, ITN in the United States. After four days on the run, Texan police have tracked down a 10-year-old Texan girl who's eight and a half months pregnant. Cindy Garcia ran away from a children's home to find the father of her baby in Mexico. Tom Bradby reports. Late last night, Cindy Garcia and her boyfriend were found at an apartment in Houston. Miss Garcia ran away from home at the weekend to be with her 22-year-old boyfriend. She is 10 years old and eight and a half months pregnant. The police found her after an anonymous tipster phoned the emergency hotline. Uh, finally, someone came to the door, asked who it was. We told them it was the police. She cracked the door. When they cracked the door, we could see the girl on the inside sitting on the couch. And we had immediately recognized her as being the one that's been in the media. We're yeah. still trying to d decide if, if, in fact, the girl is 10 years old or 14 years of, of age. Uh, she's claiming to be 14. Uh, her mother still is claiming that she's 10 years of age. That will impact the uh, charges that will be filed against the, the uh, father of the child. Neighbors and health workers have been worried about the dangers of her giving birth without proper care. The police in Houston say she appears to be in good health. Tom Bradby, ITN. Finally, millions of admirers of the poet Robert Burns are preparing for a special Burns Night celebration tonight. This year is the 200th anniversary of the poet's death and revellers are preparing to mark it in style. Glen O'Glaser is in Scotland. The Burns celebrations are in full swing, commemorating the bicentenary of the death of Scotland's national poet. And cut you up with ready slick. Oh, trench in your gushing entrails, brick. The immortal memory of Robert Burns. Robert, 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 Robert. Everywhere in Scotland, memories of the poet who's been translated into 50 languages. The ideas behind his work have a, a, a very common purpose throughout the world. Um, dignity of labour, a man's a man for all that. It, it means something worldwide. Despite being short of money, the Burns Festival, which lasts all year, is attracting international interest. Some of the stories he told me were, were really uh, capturing, you know. They'd get a hold of you and you'd start thinking about it. How did you find the language? Uh, kind of difficult. <laughs> <laughs> he has a good sense of humor, though. They're mounting fireworks displays, but more ambitious projects have been abandoned. The organizers couldn't raise enough sponsorship to celebrate the man who wrote one of the world's best-known songs. Glen O'Glaser, ITN, Ayrshire. On News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald, the blunders of the Russian troops in their battle with the Chechen rebels, new evidence of top-level mistakes. The main news is the poor results of the national curriculum tests. That's Thursday's early evening news until 5.40 tomorrow. Bye-bye. Good evening. Well, it's a bitterly cold Burns night and the weather continues in this vein with more snow showers expected tomorrow, especially for the east. Now, straight away, let's put things in context by looking at our Met Office wind flow chart here, showing freezing cold temperatures over Russia, high pressure in charge there over Scandinavia, bringing easterly winds. Now, these in turn pick up snow showers over the North Sea, pushing them in our way and especially reserved for the eastern side of the country. Now back to the moment at hand, and it's very much a case of a bitterly cold night once again, a widespread penetrating frost, obviously extra cares needed on the roads, and we have those snow showers on the eastern side of the country, but not amounting to anything very much tonight. So let's pick up on these as we go into tomorrow morning, spilling down the eastern side of the country, and then feeding across the country during the course of the day, quite persistent from time to time, fairly light in nature, but beginning to build up from around about the northeast of England, northwards, more like a light dusting further south. A cold winter's day out there to the west, but the best of the brightness here. 
So with our temperatures tomorrow severely pegged back, in fact the wind's the main thing, add on the wind and they'll feel more like around about minus 7 or minus 8. Now a very quick look ahead to the weekend, more of the same, snow showers for the eastern side of the country on Saturday, again pushing in for central as well as southern England and Wales, best of the brightness in the northwest, and on Sunday the same wintry story continues, we just hang on to some brightness in the northwest. So a cold feel to things, here's our summary. Sponsored by PowerJam, producing electricity, whatever the weather.